podcast world. This is Caribbean Power Lunch, where we feature Black-owned businesses. I am your host, Kevin Valley, and today I am in the freezing cold Toronto. I am here talking to an innovation researcher, a learning strategist, process designer, and a fellow podcaster. Welcome today, the host of Disruptive Conversations podcast, the TEDx Port of Spain licensee holder, and the head and partner of innovation and development at the Covenant Group in Toronto, Dr. Hita Deming. Thanks for having me on the show. Hita, I nearly um, ran out of breath doing that intro just now. <laughs> <laughs> You're a busy guy, man. Yeah, I get bored easily, so I get I... Well, yeah, that's why you like to disrupt everything, right? <laughs> Do stuff. Keep the hustle on, my friend. Keep the hustle on. Hustle. It's a hustle. <laughs> That's interesting. So, Keto, how I want to start this. As a young boy growing up in Chagones, making custard with your granddad every other week, what sparked this? Like, did you always used to get bored? Did you always say, hey, let me want to disrupt this? Did you ever want to disrupt the custard making process? Tell me about that. How was that like? I think I've been fortunate enough to have parents who've always encouraged me to think differently and think independently. So I went to presentation college to go on us. And I think my brother and I got into trouble more for challenging the status quo than for anything else. So we were known as troublemakers, but I don't think it was that. I think it was that we always asked questions. If I had to put it down to something, it was my dad would say, any rule in the house can change if you have a better reason. So if you come up with a better reason for this rule than we have, you can change it. You have to have a good reason. So everything was based on a rationale. So they would put a reason for every single rule we had. And if they didn't have a rule or a reason for it, they would say, we can't defend this rule, so this rule is gone. My parents were radical like that. So when you go to school in Trinidad and people say, do something because I said so, that was in direct contrast to how I was being raised at home. So if a teacher says, do something, and I say, why? I would say, but that's not a reason. And then my dad would teach me things like, that's an appeal to authority, so that's not a good reason. That's a strawman argument, so that's not a good reason. And I would see teachers making these arguments and be like, yeah, I don't buy that. And that would always get me into trouble. So I think my dad and my mom, they both have always taught me to question everything. It's almost like your home was your safe place to go and debate whatever it is you want. But when you go to school, you have to follow this rigid, traditional, authoritative structure. I think a big part of why people feel like they can challenge the status quo is because they feel like no matter how different they are, they'll be accepted in their community. So my tribe was my parents as a child. And I never questioned whether or not my parents would have my back. So a big part of being able to be brave and be courageous to like go out in the world and say, this could be different. You have to know you have the support. And I think there's a piece around belonging and knowing that you have a community no matter what. So you said your, your parents were very radical and everything. And you, you were chatting a bit before we started recording. You were chatting a very long time before we started recording. <laughs> and you said your, both of your parents were entrepreneurs and they always... They always encouraged that in you and your brother. Yeah, they did. They did. So I think what they did is they taught me the value of money. So they always were like, if ever you have money, you have to earn it. So I watched other friends in school. They would get like $20, 30 $40 a day to spend in it from their parents. Wow. And what year was this? <laughs> you know, <laughs> maybe not 40 but 20 10 whatever. That's good money. Kids always had more cash than me. And... My parents would give me lunch. I would take lunch to school. My, and it probably become my dad was a financial advisor. So he taught people how to save for retirement. So he was teaching me the same thing. But if I was spending money, or well, when I went to school, he would say, you only need this much money to get to school and back. Here's $2, $3 in case something happened. Everything else you have to earn. And I think as a result of that, I became very entrepreneurial. So... Again, there's a very good business model. Eh? Mm -hmm. And mom used to travel a lot for work. I'd always ask her to buy me comics and comic cards. And she would say, why? I said, just buy as many as you can. We want this series. We want this kind, etc. We want holographic. We want whatever. And that's because I could go back and sell them. 
The best part about that is I wasn't paying for the raw good. I was getting that for free. <laughs> <laughs> so your mom was your first investor. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very good business model for me, not very good for her. <laughs> but I was always very entrepreneurial. Like, hope you gave us some some cash back. So you gave no, no. In those days, in those days, it was... <laughs> thanks, eh, moms. <laughs> and it, it was all since she find a rare card or something, and she knew when she went away. That's what I wanted. I wanted like comic cards and comic books. So I could sell that in school and make money. You were disrupting your primary school, or is this your secondary school? I would say secondary school because my primary school was a bit odd because I went to. So one of the things about my own experience in Trinidad is I've experienced Trinidad in many different layers and levels. Right. So if you grew up in Shugonas, Edinburgh Gardens, and all the guys in Edinburgh Gardens, you know you grew up with some people who have money and some people who don't. Right. And the great democratizer was the soccer field. So it didn't matter what side of the fence it came on. You had to prove your worth with how good we are on the ball. So that didn't matter where you came from nice. when you play. And the easiest way to describe it, which is not factually true, but let's say I came from one side of the fence, which was kind of middle class, on one side of the field, and then guys from the other side of the field, they came from sort of poor backgrounds, etc. And I think having had that experience where I was very good friends with people who were of different socioeconomic backgrounds, I understood Trinidad in a very different way. So my primary school, I went to St. Peter's private primary school, which is on an oil refinery. Then I think like standard three or whatever is standard three. I went to a public school called Capuchama Roman Catholic school, which is like polar opposites of privilege and et cetera in Trinidad. And you're going from like, from seeing expat kids to black and East Indian kids living in Capuchama living in boathouses, some were from squatting villages. I didn't understand those concepts. I learned that concept young. I mean, and then my parents would take me to Harvard's to play football in Port of Spain. I lived in Chimonas, went to school in San Fernando, and I went and played football in Harvard's in Port of Spain, and I'd meet, like, actually met your brother. Yeah. He and I used to play football together. I met a lot of my friends through Harvard's, and those would be Tong boys, Port of Spain boys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I had this really interesting cross-section of understanding Trinidad. So I had a very strong community in San Fernando, a very strong community in Chagones. I was from Chagones. And a strong community in Port of Spain because I played cricket, rugby, football at Harvard's. And that gave me a very strong network in, in, in Port of Spain because it was more... Oh, Harvard's had a lot of the popular boys who were going to a lot of different schools like Trinity, Fatima, or whatever. So it ended up being a very interesting understanding of Trinidad. And I think that has really made me be able to travel through different kinds of cultures and do code switching and understand people from different parts and aspects of Trinidad. So how do we go from there to you going to Canada? I think it was 2004 or so to do your undergrad. It's 2002, but facts to matter. <laughs> I knew I needed to leave Trinidad. Part of that was because at the time, a lot of the boys around my age were involved in gangs and violence and stuff. And my parents decided, you just need to leave. So part of that. And I decided, well, I was supposed to get like football scholarships and stuff, but I got eight. Oh, you're that good? Yeah. yeah. So, so I, at one point, I had like 15 offers of scholarships and stuff, but I told my Achilles and lost scholarships. Then I was trying to get a scholarship for rugby I played for Trinidad briefly, like very briefly. I don't know if I'm allowed to say I played for Trinidad, but I, I wore the uniform. Yeah, you played for Trinidad. And I traveled with them, so I yeah. played for Trinidad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was brief. Um, I was trying to get rugby scholarships. None of that worked out because of injuries and competitions or whatever. And Canada was my cheapest option. And I looked at where was the warmest place in Canada. And I went to Vancouver. And I always knew I didn't want to go where Trinidad's were. I didn't want to go to Howard. I didn't want to go anywhere where there was a ton of Trinis. So Miami's out. Miami was out. Howard was out. There's lots of options. I, out. I wanted to go somewhere where I would get a brand new experience and meet people and ideas I've never encountered before. And UBC was a transformative experience for me because 
University of British Columbia because I had never met people who spoke five languages. I never met people who had spoke five languages, went to international schools, like their parents were diplomats. Like the kind of wealth I met at UBC was insane. And then I met, there was a guy I met who was from Libya. I'll tell this story. He and I are playing football and in the changing room, he takes over his shirt and I see a scar on his belly. Appendix. Appendix. So I was like, interesting. So you don't ask him anything in the change room because that's kind of awkward. Right. So we get to know each other after a while. And one day, feeling comfortable, and I said, look, his name is Mo. Mohammed is his name. His name is Mohammed, Mohammed, actually. So I said, Mo, how you got that scar on your belly? Because that's a pretty nasty scar. He said, I am from Libya. and You have to be in the army. And we were protecting a border. And his appendix burst. The nearest hospital was miles away. And if they tried to get him to the hospital, he would die. A young doctor who was not fully trained was nearby. Came, took the knife at the edge of the gun, cut him open, no anesthetic, etc. Took out his appendix while they were taking him to the hospital. So he had a, the sky is terrible. It's ugly. That had never crossed my mind because I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. There's a hospital within 15 or 20 minutes of everywhere I am. That blew my mind. So you had those kinds of experiences where you had people who came from very privileged backgrounds and people who came from very like places I couldn't even conceive. Countries that were constantly at war. One of my best friends is from Rwanda and he lived through the Rwanda genocide. Understanding those kinds of stories were like absolutely transformative to me. But also made me realize that kids living in the ghetto and in gangs and stuff like that they are experiencing similar things to people who are in war-torn zones, except that that's their life all the time. So all the trauma they experience, et cetera. So those experiences have been very, put things in perspective for me in like real ways. Yeah, so it's like they added even more layers. Yeah, it's just to your life the world is complicated. Not everybody is given the same cards to play with. Some people are given all the Trump cards and some people only have two hearts and that's it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I mean, so, and I think that's the minute you realize that, you know what I mean? Or some people, all they get is, like, if you play all fours, all they get is tens and twos. So everybody just, and jacks. So the jacks just keep in the high, people keep taking the tens and the life just, you know what I mean? And since some people just getting all the ace two, ace two king, queen. Sometimes you just have to play for game and sometimes you're ready. Have high yeah, and low. You don't have the cards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if you don't understand all fours, check me on the flip side. With <laughs> so you finished that degree in what, 2008? And then 2009, you, you decided to go and do a master's one time, right away? No, nah, I finished, I actually finished in 2007, finished school. But um, okay. the University of British Columbia had this program that if there was a course that you wanted to take that was not offered at the school, you can teach it. So you had to have certain grades and all that. So I did that. So I stayed an extra year to teach this one course, but you had to be an undergraduate student. What was the name of this course? It's Positive Psychology. Yeah. I taught the first Positive Psychology course at the University of British Columbia. I guess that's kind of disruptive, but anyway. Yeah, I guess, right? <laughs> <laughs> A little bit. How old were you? I decided like 23? No, nah, well, no, because no, I started school at 20. I went to school late. Okay. So when I was there... I was doing a lot of leadership programming. So I've always been doing leadership training. So I went to like, I, I worked at YMCA doing leadership camps and I was a counselor and like my mom is a trainer and facilitator. Like I've been in that world a long time. So I've always educated people. And I was always doing leadership development at UBC and my jobs were always around teaching other students how to be leaders. And advising. And then one kid came to me one day and said, I'm in crisis. I don't know if I want to be an engineer or a doctor. I was like, dude, that's not a crisis. <laughs> like, sorry. It's all perspective, right? It's not a crisis. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, you know? I understand what you're saying, but I was like, this is nonsense. Anyway. So I left that job and I went to work with kids who had addictions and drugs and stuff. And that work was challenging and difficult. And like, I was working with kids who coming off of binges of heroin and like D 
detox and support and recovery. That's what I was doing. And I left that job one day because I picked up a girl who had done every single drug on the books and her dad was a pimp. She was about 12. And she wanted to leave the program and legally I was required to take her back to her guardian, who's her dad, who's a pimp. I refused to do that. And my boss called me and said, technically I should be firing you for this, but I, under any moral conscience, can I fire you for this? Because you're right. The system is wrong. And that's when I understood that systems is the most important thing to fight against. I always understood that. But that's when I decided it's a systems issue. I left that job and I went to work at UBC again. And my task was to sort of turn this program with the help of a mentor. Turn all the programs into student-led programs. So before the programs were faculty invented and faculty imagined and faculty led. So they wanted to flip them upside down. So in order to do this, I had to understand organizational change and development. And I fell in love with the concept of organizational change and development. That's when I first realized that nothing we do in this world is done without organizing. Nothing. Nothing. You accomplish nothing in this world without organizing. And you accomplish nothing in this world without getting together with somebody and a collaboration. Can't do it alone. Can't do it alone. You have to do it yourself, but you can't do it alone. And from that day forward, I decided the two things I need to understand. How do you collaborate? How do you organize? And how do you build organizations? And a boss of mine said to me there, I'll never forget this. Her name is Caroline Ruckett, mentor of mine, friend to this day. She said, if you are here in two years, I will personally fire you. You need to leave here to grow. That's what she said to me. I went and found a program that had organizational change and international development. And I went and did that as a master's program. I got an award for my thesis. It was the first academic award I've ever gotten because I was never a good student. At all. I find that hard to believe, Dr. Deming. The reason I was a good student is because I found something I was passionate about. I was passionate about organizational change. And before I was a terrible student, I got my first, like at UBC, I was on academic probation at one point. Like I barely made it through my undergrad. Then you taught a course. <laughs> yeah, and then, yeah, there's a whole long story there with another teacher who like transformed my life. And I, and then I got my first semester where I got my first A's and stuff. And there's a girl who I'm friends with today. Today, she was part of that group of people who was, who helped me get my first proper A's. But my first two years in university was pressure because I hadn't found something I loved. And that's the problem with streaming in schools, which is why I'm adamantly against the way we do schooling in Trinidad. Because let's go back to presentation college. I had a teacher who said, every time I sign him up a reading, he doesn't do it. When he writes an essay, he's clearly read, well read. And he has all this information from all these places, but it's not from any of the books we are signing. My mom was like, well, assign different books. But she, he couldn't because the CXC curriculum was very strict on what you can assign. Or how about give people topics, let people choose their own books? Yeah, exactly. But anyway, the point is, yeah. you get my point, right? Yeah. That it, the system wasn't even designed for you to pursue things that were interesting to you. So again, that's a system system. I mean, it's not necessarily a person. Yeah. So I think there are two things that make people successful. Your drive and motivation. How bad do you want it? And two... Is the system you're in enabling and allowing you to climb the ladder? When those two things exist, you get magic. When one of those things is missing, you get frustrated people or you get chaos, like you get, because it's like structured, right? So just in case somebody was daydreaming, just in case somebody was driving and missed that, I want to go over those two points one more time. Do you mind doing that? Yeah, so my theory, there's no research in this, is that there are two things that are fundamental to your success. An enabling environment or system. So the system you're in has to allow you to climb the ladder. That's one. Climbing the ladder is hard because you have competition, you have other people climbing the ladder. So the second thing that has to be there is motivation and drive. Those two things, when they come together, produce magic. And assuming this person has mental capability, they don't have handicaps, etc. There's a lot of assumptions, but, right. but 
But the average person or the person who has is of good intelligence and people can be disabled and all that. But if the environment allows you opportunity and you seek opportunity and those two things come together, it's magic. All right. I want to touch more on that a little later, but right now I see you. So right after you did this master's and all this, after you say, Hey, you don't really like school that much. You decide to go and do a PhD. Oh, that was accidental. That was accidental. Oops. I'm in a PhD class. <laughs> I call myself an accidental academic because I was never a good student. And when I got, I got the award for my master's program and I was like, wait, I'm good at this thing. And I decided to apply to PhD program. I applied to one PhD program. It was a PhD program that was fully funded. And I said, let me apply to this and see what happened. I got fully funded. Because I got fully funded, I was like, well, if somebody's paying for this, I'm going to go do this. I get to choose what I want to read for the next four years. And I finished my PhD in five years. And I was heads down, nose to the grind and... So you like reading. You say you get, you get to choose what you want to read. No, then I fell in love with reading. I fell in love with reading about organizational change and development. And Slowly but surely, you went from being a bad student to a good student. So it's really not that you were a bad student. You're just unmotivated student. I think I'm still a bad student. After the awards and the doctorate? Yeah, because I'm a good self-directed learner. I'm a bad student. Ah, that's I get. That's a very that's different thing. Then I'm probably a bad student too. <laughs> I'm a very bad student. Like... When things are dictated to me, it's very difficult for me to follow. Right. And, that is, and that's not true. There are some things I'm a good student for. Like there's some things if you give me instructions for, I follow and like that kind of thing. So you do your PhD in workplace learning and social change. Is it just because they give you it for free? Like, is there an end game in mind? No, honestly, I wanted five years to read. You just wanted to read for five years and leave, let people leave you alone. And actually part of the other big issue was, it was 2010. It was just after the economic crisis. I had just left England. England was bad. Canada was bad. The US was bad. There was no jobs. And I had a full scholarship to go and do a PhD. If you're watching a market like that, best thing to do is to go back to school. So I went back to school. And then in between that, I started TED Exporter Spain and did some other stuff. Oh, by the way, let's start TED Exporter Spain. Tell me about, let's talk about TED Exporter Spain. So, I mean, we're all fans of TEDx. Means most people who listen to podcasts like this will, will be seeking out to consume content of that level, you know, kind of brain food and everything, right? And we all, we all have seen these Simon Sinek start with why TEDx talk and everything. What made you decide to say, hey, let me bring this to Trinidad? And how did you go about getting that license? There are two reasons. One, the same positive psychology course I took, the professor who was his supervisor had just come from the TED Talks. And he said, before you teach this course, you have to watch a TED Talk by Martin Sagman, who had just done a TED Talk on positive psychology. I watched that one TED Talk and then I just watched like 10 other TED Talks after that. And I was like, I was hooked. It was like YouTube for people who didn't like cats videos. Because <laughs> in those days, YouTube was cat videos. Right. YouTube was, does he? I think it still is. Or is it like slime and stuff now? No, but you have a lot more better content now. But right. the early days of YouTube was terrible. It was absolutely terrible. But I had discovered TED. So it was this amazing thing. And then the University of British Columbia did Terry Talks, which was one of the first TED, TEDx events. And I helped some people organize that event. And I was like, I can't remember the population of UBC right now, but I think it was like something like 20,000 students or 18,000 students at UBC. And I was like, this event could transform my country. My country has 1.3 million people. I could transform 20,000 people. I could transform my country. I don't need to transform 1.3 million people. I need to transform 10,000, 20,000. And that will transform the whole country. And I was like, this brand is what will do that. And I went and I waited because it was while I was at UBC, I had that insight. And then as soon as I finished my master's, I went back to Trinidad and I decided, you finished your master's program. You're now living in Trinidad. Do something that you're likely to fail at. What is something big that you can do that you're likely to fail at? And I had this like seed of an idea to do a TEDx event. At this point, I had never done understood prediction. I never understood speaker coaching. There were all these things I had no clue about. But we went and we got TEDx poisoning from an idea to eight years later of the 18,000 events. 
1% of those events around you will have talks on TED.com and we have three of them. So we've done well. Yeah, that's, that's pretty well. And I have to say, I think the piece that people miss about TED is that TED is a talent attractor. People who love TED are also good talent for companies. So my volunteer strategy was, anybody who came to me and say, hey, I love TED and I want to help, I used to say, come. And we figure out what you could do along the way. And what I did was that I had really smart, curious people who were thinking and passionate about TED, and we built a fantastic organization. And I can't take credit for all of that at all. All I could take credit for is like, planting the seed. Other people made that stuff happen. Other people have done amazing projects, ideas within TED under the TED Exporters being brand. But it's at a talent attraction. And I think most companies miss out on that opportunity when they don't send their employees to TED Exporters. I don't think they understand how much of a talent pool is attracted to TED. Yeah. I think they miss that. Yeah, because I was at the last TED Exporters main event in October 2018. And I was just looking at it from a logistics standpoint, like, wow, they have thought about everything. So rain happens to fall. So it's Trinidad. There's a 50% chance of rain, right? And they had volunteers taking umbrellas and walking people across the lunch stops so that they wouldn't get wet when they get to lunch. Like, this is, it was such a well thought. So you find it was like a world class event. The best thing about that is, oh, we had a volunteer training session. And one of the things we teach people is we teach people around client experience. So the, the client experience is, comes first. We found out that volunteers were doing that umbrella thing after. We never mandated that. We never said that. So I'll give you a story. Isidore Sharp, legendary founder of Four Seasons, when asked how it is that Four Seasons can charge twice the room rate of any other hotel of a similar rating, he answered, it's because we do common things uncommonly well. Yeah. The beauty is in the details. The beauty is in the minutia. If you listen to stories of him, people who work at Four Seasons know that if a patron leaves their briefcase and it goes into a taxi, they can jump in a taxi after it, follow that person, give them the briefcase, and when they come back, the company will reimburse them that money. They know that. So they're willing to take that risk which goes all the way back to that first conversation I said, where I felt I had a tribe and I belonged to my tribe because my parents gave me that space to take that risk. So in TEDx, we make it a tribe. You belong to this tribe. You can take the risk to do what is best for the organization. Number one rule is protect the team and protect the organization. Do nothing to jeopardize your brand. That's the number one rule. Protect the team and protect the organization. Yeah. Essentially, employees slash volunteers first, rather than your customers, yeah, the, your clients first. Yeah, the employees first, customers second, 100%. And you take care of your team, they will take care of your, your people. They will take care of your organization. And people miss that. Okay, so you have a strong team. You have a strong brand. So you naturally have, you, have a, you have an audience or following who wants to see this, right? How do you go ahead attracting speakers? I know only attracting speakers, attracting the right speakers and making sure that they deliver well on that yeah. high stakes event. I'll tell you a secret. Every year we get something wrong with speakers every year, like, but we try really hard. But also every year we take big risks with a speaker. Our speaker process is rigorous. So we have on the website, we have people submit. We have a network of people that we email and ask who are in the know and say, who are some people to be looking at and who might give TED Exporters being talks. Today we have a list of about 150 names of people who we... Well, Trinidadian and diaspora. All connected to Trinidad in some way. Right. They could be diaspora or they could be living in Trinidad. I mean, once they're connected to diaspora, right? Once you know what carnival is, you're so in the, first, <laughs> in the first two years, you had to have played three carnivals in order to be on the diaspora's main stage. That was the rule. That rule is, is, <laughs> has become most... I love that rule. <laughs> yeah, that was the initial rule. That rule was developed by Mark Lindsay, photographer in Trinidad. Shout out to Mark Lindsay. But with respect to speakers, I think if you pick people who are... Humble, Charlotte Elias was on our team, and I gave her full credit for this. She said, pick speakers who are humble. Once we made that shift, it changed the kind of speakers we were attracting. Because before we were going for people who had big names, who could pull a crowd, and da-da-da. We picked people who we thought were deep in a topic and humble. 
And that combination makes for excellent speakers. People who are not humble, we can't coach them. And the, one of the things that I think, I fundamentally believe, I could coach any speaker to be a TEDx speaker. I coach anybody. You personally? I personally believe that. Sorry, I personally, but I think anybody is coachable to do a good TEDx talk. You have to be humble enough to take the coaching. And we have a rigorous process. So pick you, we got you to do a, you do a script, blah, blah, blah. So we have a whole process. And I think what people misunderstand about innovation is innovation is first and foremost about process. Strong processes bring good results. So for example, when we pick a speaker, we have four criteria by which we choose a speaker. So on the team, like we just did this, we boil it down to 15 speakers right now. We rate you on four scales, coachability, likability, ideas, with spreading, humility, and something else. But those are the five criteria we rate you on, and you have to get a passing grade on certain things. And there's some people, we don't know that speaker well enough to vote them on some things. So we take that out. So like, for example, I've never met the speaker, I can't fit for them and hum, humility and that kind of so thing. So networking is a big part of it as well. So we call people who know them. So we look on Facebook, look on LinkedIn, who know them and call people and say, you know this person, tell me about them. And what we're looking for is humility and looking for coachability. Once we kind of have a gut feeling that person coachable, we invite them. And then every year we take a risk on a speaker. Somebody who's an unlikely candidate. Some people will be like, huh, interesting choice. But that's deliberate. But if you look at the whole process, it's about it's about process. Process is what gives you good results. That's what brings you innovation. And people, most of innovation is mundane, boring stuff like spreadsheets and systems and checklists. Most of innovation is boring stuff like that. And the better you are at those kind of things, the easier it is for you to get to innovation. People don't understand that. So during your PhD period, you got to read whatever you want. Now, by doing TEDx for this being, you get to listen to whatever ideas you want to hear about. So in doing this and listening to these various talks and everything, like, what have you learned? What inspires you the most from what you've heard? Because I was saying, like, for me, when I do interviews like this, when I do a good interview and I, and I feel like the conversation went well, I sleep well that night. Like, I, I get a high of a, having a good, productive conversation with somebody. You know what I think inspires me? People who have a dream and a vision and are working to build that dream and vision, even if it's against the odds. One of the things we do is we make heroes of entrepreneurs and people who are disruptive and that kind of thing. We, we have a very rugged, individualistic kind of culture, especially in North America. And I think it's inspiring when people break rank and do things that are in a non-traditional route because there's so much pressure to just conform. There's just an incredible amount of pressure to follow a sort of traditional job. Okay, so you go to school, you get a career, you get a job, you stay in that job, blah, 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 you do that. Now, in no way do I want to belittle that. I think there's a lot to be proud of, of people who do that. Any person who goes to work every day, works their butt off, provides for their family. That is a very admirable thing to do. But it, it does inspire me when people break rank and do things in very non-traditional ways. And there's no road in front of them and they're building that road. I find that inspiring without belittling people who are going down a road where they, they know where that road leads. So... I think it's really inspiring when people are building their own road, walk, like building their own bridge as they walk on it. Like, I had an ex-girlfriend who bought, bought me a book called Build a Bridge as You Walk on It, and she understood me. Yeah. So it was, she understood me. She, like, there are two things she told me. One, she bought me that book, and two, she told me the longest distance I'll ever travel is between my head and my heart. Wow. That's what she Deep. said. <laughs> she was right. She was 100% right. And until I, I lived too much in my head and I didn't do enough heart, I was too logical and strategic. And when we broke up, she told me that and she was absolutely right. But now, I mean, now you have a heart. I mean, I know you just had a, a young child. You I've always had a heart. I was like <laughs> straw man from like... <laughs> <laughs> bad or whatever. 
Is that a straw man or tin man? One of them didn't have a, I think tin man didn't have a heart. But anyway, I was <laughs> at a heart, but I just, I preference my head. I try to be a logical person and it doesn't always work. I get that. I completely get that. I completely get that. So you have TEDx going on. You're learning from, from these speakers, from these guys who have a, the bravado to break ground and go against the status quo. And then you, you didn't have enough there, though. You decide, hey, what's going to happen? I'm going to start a podcast. I'm going to start a disruptive conversations podcast. What's wrong? Dr. Wrong? Nothing <laughs> wrong. <laughs> nah, the podcast was really... So for my thesis, I end up looking at what I call, and a lot of other people call social innovation. And to me, I think the future of innovation is social. And by that, I mean, we are going to solve the technical problems very soon. Like things that can be solved with machines and algorithms, etc., will be resolved really soon. The last frontier of AI and technology will be human problems, social problems. So I think the future of innovation is social. And, I, and that's what I mean by social innovation. So problems that are social, which is distinct from problems that the way most people define social is like in terms of good or giving back, etc. I'm talking about the interactions between human beings. Uh-huh. So problems that are social in nature, not necessarily problems that are about doing good and like nonprofit and all that. That's not what I'm talking about. So I think that's, that's an important piece to think about with that. But when I did my PhD on that, I wanted to study people who were tackling what I call social innovation. And I couldn't develop a study that was rigorous enough for academia for me to do that, just because I didn't have a big enough sample size. Yeah, all those kind of technical kind of issues. So as soon as I finished my PhD, I just started to interview people who were disrupting a sector or system. And I was interested in a very specific thing. I fundamentally believe that Everything we do is driven by a script that has either been co-developed by our own experiences, external experiences, and our own motivation and drive. But we have a story in our head that drives us. I absolutely believe that. If we are going to change in any way, we have to disrupt the script in our head first. Then we have to disrupt the narrative and stories people tell around something. So, for example... If you want to stop people from smoking, you have to disrupt the whole idea that smoking is cool and smoking is like good for me and stuff. Mm -hmm. Because at one point, people believed smoking was good and smoking was cool. So you have to first disrupt that narrative. Secondly, you have to disrupt the narrative. You have to create a narrative where there's social pressure to stop smoking. So you have to change that. So there's an internal disruption that has to happen and there's an external disruption that has to happen. So there's a individual, and then there's a systemic or environmental change that has to happen, right? right? Mm -hmm. So I think you have to have conversations that disrupt that script in a way that it rewrites it. And that's what a disruptive conversation is. And it comes from my insight that one of my favorite authors is a woman called Patricia Shaw, and she talks about how organizations are conversations and not machines. If you read traditional management, the analogy is like well-oiled machine. We come from a scientific management kind of approach where it's about efficiency. and It's about how do we make things work like a clock? You know? Organizations do not work like that. Number one, a clock has fixed number of parts and can only be this big. An organization can be greater than the sum of its parts. Therefore, it doesn't follow science in that same way. It doesn't follow the analogies that have to do with technical science doesn't make sense with machinery and engines and those kind of things don't make sense in social systems in companies. So more than anything, a company is a conversation. First, you change a conversation inside a company and you change and transform that company. And that's what Patricia talks, Shaw talks about. And that's kind of where disruptive conversations comes from, where it was really what I wanted to do for my PhD thesis, wasn't allowed to do it. So I just like, now for fun, I interview people on my podcast, Disruptive Conversation. 
people who are trying to disrupt the sector or system. What's the, what's the common thing you see in all of them? Is it that same mindset that you're just talking about? You know, that's a good question. I was actually thinking about that recently. I think there are lots of themes. I don't see a common theme across the board. One of my more recent interviews was a, a guy called Martin Hectors. Martin Hectors has an interesting background, worked at Nokia, worked with like a lot of cloud software innovation kind of thing. And he made a point that is not new to me, but he made it, the way he articulated it, hit me in the middle of my head. Like, mm-hmm. So one of my beefs is that innovation always talks about we need to feel and feel often and all that. And I feel I, forward and feel forward. And then I think that's true, but I think more importantly, it's about capturing the learning from failure. That's one. I think, and I think more successful teams fail more often than less successful teams because it costs the innovation, innovating. If you're innovating, you're going to make mistakes, you're going to fail. That's what's going to happen. And it's not about failing often. It's about learning from mistakes more. And it's so people emphasize the wrong thing. They have to emphasize failure, and not the learning. What Martin brought and reminded me was first thing you have to do is manage the emotions around failure. So you put out a new product out there, customer has a bad experience. Manager who has to manage that customer's bad experience is very likely to like scathe people under their charge for trying something innovative that didn't work. Can't do that. What they're going to do is just lock up and they're not going to take any risks. Yeah, kill the whole system of innovation. So it's the emotion around learning and failure that you have to manage. And I think that's where the art of having a good conversation comes. So although you have to have a conversation that disrupts a script in people's heads, I think the most important thing is how do you manage the emotions in the conversation so that things don't escalate? That is kind of what I'm trying to study right now. I'm trying to study how do you have difficult conversations with people without escalating. So for example, one of the things that people describe Barack Obama as is he used to be in a debate team and they say he had a gift of debating with people and they still like him after. How does he do that? Emotional intelligence. I don't know if it's that, but I don't know if it's emotional intelligence, but it's because if I'm debating you and I'm proving you wrong, mm-hmm. It's very difficult for me on the receiving end to still like you. Yeah, but if you're proving me wrong in a way that's constructive for both parties, so if in your mind you're seeking a win-win... I don't know if that's emotional intelligence or if there's a skill around the way you have conversations, the way you frame things, if you ask questions more. Like, I'm not sure it's an emotional intelligence thing. Oh, okay. it could be intent then. It's an art. Like, I think there's, a, mm-hmm. there's an art there. I had to have a very difficult conversation recently and... I was part of a group and we were having a conversation and one, some, one person said, you're getting defensive. And I said, stop, not getting defensive. The difference is, these are the data. These are the things we can't argue. And we all agree on these three things, right? Yes. We of us have different conclusions from that data. That's true. Just switching the word from defensive to conclusions changed his entry into that conversation. Right? So if I say you're getting defensive, he wants to defend that he's not getting defensive. He can't debate that this is the data. You made certain conclusions about that data. So that's how you have that conversation instead. So we want to get into the practical tips here as we're kind of winding down. So on your website, on your ketodemy.com website, you lay out a roadmap with three stages, a strategy, catalyst, and learning spaces, right? I want to add a fourth element to that and we'll get there. So first question, how do we go about identifying innovation opportunities? Like what's the process of finding innovation opportunities is that, you know, people say, hey, I get ideas when I take a shower or when I smoke weed. I don't know if I can say that. <laughs> or, or something like that. So how would you advise people to go ahead and, you know, Get innovative. The first thing, stop looking for a formula. Mm-hmm. That's number one. Theresa Mabley has, she's a Harvard professor, and she describes 
creativity novelty that works. I describe innovation as the implementation of novelty that works. So I think you have to create spaces for people in organizations to create and generate novelty. So in my TEDx Port of Spain team, one of the things we protect, we made a mistake recently and I, we caught it and we are like, this is never happening again. We had a particular speaker who was practicing and the talk was not good. But one person started off by saying, hey, I love that talk. It was amazing. It was great. And everybody was then too shy to come back and say, hey, you know what? I didn't like that talk. That talk was terrible. I wasn't part of that inside the room, but I watched the video. That talk was terrible. Why, why are you letting her do this talk? And I called the speaker and said, look, you have a lot of work to do. You need to redo your script, blah, blah, et cetera. It's no fault of the team. It is a fault of the team, but it's human nature or part of our social pressures. And if the first person that speaks says, I love that talk, it's very difficult for you to then go and say, I have the absolute opposite experience. I think that was one of the worst talks I've ever heard. We need to do something about it, and this is why. It's very difficult to do that in the room with other people. Novelty comes out because people are not afraid say what they really feel in a kind and respectful way. I'm not a fan of candor, like radical candor. I think people need to have kind candor. Right, I agree. You can say anything, say it kindly, that's all. You have to say it. So that was, a, that was an experience we had in the team. And then after that, we pulled the team together and said, that must never happen again. You see something like that, you speak up because it is unfair to the speaker. Because our one job at TEDx has been is to make sure that person gives the best talk they can, given the resources we have and they have. That's our one job. If we think that talk needs work and we don't tell that person, that's on us. So that's an example of where the innovation has to come from having the space to create that novelty. I'll give you another example. I love talking about and thinking about ecosystems and resilience and that kind of thing. And when you have two ecosystems that overlap, there's a space in between. And I listened to a podcast recently that talked about how Yo-Yo Ma calls those head spaces, I think he calls them. I'm getting that right. But what we know is that in spaces where ecosystems overlap, that's the place where new life forms, the most new life forms emerge. So in order for you to get innovation, there's a piece where of innovation where Multiple disciplines and perspectives and ideas need to come together. And when they overlap, that's where the most new ideas are going to. Can you give us an example of that? Well, he calls it edge effects. He calls it edge effects. Edge effects, all right. Can you give us an example? So, of so same Yo-Yo Ma thing. It was on a podcast I listened to. Yo-Yo Ma got together a group of musicians called the Silk Road Musicians. And what he was doing was bringing the best musicians from all around the world and getting them to play and jam together. So you have like somebody playing a sitar with a bagpipe, with a trumpet, etc. As a result of that, they're creating some of the best music in the world, some of the most like crazy music in the world. Like it's insane. And they are selling out and like creating all these new things because it's, it's in that edge. It's in that edge. The other person who's, and I'm going to give a massive shout out, Etienne Charles, fellow Trinidadian. He is working in those edges. He, his recent, most recent album, Carnival. The thing that I really like about what he's done is that I love First Principles. I like going back to the roots. He's gone to the root of car Carnival, talking about tambu, bamboo, etc. And he's merging that with jazz. To a lot of modern music, etc. But in his music, you hear tambu, bamboo knocking, you hear drums, you like, he is operating in that. He is merging two things that shouldn't be together. People don't come together because Tambu Bambu in Trinidad is not considered a very elite thing as for a certain group of people. And he's taking that and putting it on big stages, some of the most profound stages in the world and playing that as music and representing us. Because you know what he's doing? He's going deep into ourselves 
and then taking what he's gone deep in. So a big part of innovation is that you have to be deep in something. So you have to have a deep expertise in something. Right. And then you go and you reach out and you find those spaces where you get those edge effects. So those are two examples of people where I think, and they're both musical examples. This happened to be, be music, but they're people who are playing in those edge spaces and they're looking for edge effects. And your website, you talk about catalyzing plausible innovation opportunities. You just give us some color on that. So I wrote that a long time ago. I should probably revisit that. But <laughs> <laughs> basically what I, the message I'm trying to get there is I talk about practical innovation, right? And I go back to talking about innovation is mostly about checklist and mundane things. And there's a, there's a way in which people think about innovation as these fancy things, but they're not. Innovation, there's a lot of stuff around innovation that is quite boring and mundane. Think about your favorite app that you think is innovative. Some poor sucker sat down and wrote a ton of code that was very boring and a very laborious thing to do. That yeah. Just think about that. Like That is what a lot of innovation is about. So when I talk about catalyzing ideas, it's about reminding people. So I was in a meeting once. This idiot. Oh, boy. Come out and said, <laughs> there's nothing here that like is exciting and sparks me and da-da-da. How is this innovative? <laughs> I was like, you clearly have no idea what innovation is. But yeah. <laughs> first of all, it only takes it. If you have something that's 100% this way and you introduce a new 10%, that's usually what it is to be innovative. So for example, let's go back to our favorite example, Uber and Airbnb. Uber in particular is maybe 5% new, maybe 1% new. Rest of it was stuff that existed before. All you're doing is, before you used to pick up a phone and call a taxi. Mm -hmm. All you're doing today is picking up a phone and you're pressing a button and calling a taxi. Essentially, it's the same thing. Yeah, but you just kind of transform the whole user experience. You can track where the car is, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But before you could track where the car was, you just had to call and be like, how long is the car? Well, it's about five minutes away. And that was, they were using radios. They could tell you what corner they are and that, yeah. Now with technology, so the technology was able to improve the customer experience. Right. But fundamentally, there's nothing really new about Uber. Nothing. Like you're hailing a taxi. All you have is more data. That's pretty much what you have. And it's more convenient and blah, blah. You just have way more eyesight on when the thing is actually going to be there. That's the only difference. I think innovation is about novel combinations of things. So it's novelty that works. It's combining things in new ways. Like in Trinidad, we have novelty around food. Like my favorite thing in Trinidad is a stew chicken roti. Oh, God. <laughs> Understand? No, boy, stew chicken roti. Oh, my God. You got to try it. Who making that? It used to be in the presentation college, you got us cafeteria. That's that was the first place I discovered it, stew chicken roti. Honestly, a stew chicken roti is amazing. I mean, sometimes I might eat roti skin with some, with some stew chicken, but that's something you do at home. You do that in private. You don't show people that. But as I mean, it tastes good. <laughs> <laughs> it tastes good. All right, so we covered identifying innovation opportunities. We covered catalyzing plausible innovation opportunities. We covered learning spaces already. So how do we design systems to ensure that innovation is not a one-off occurrence? Because that's the, that's the challenge. So you could innovate a product and your, your product could be the newest on the market right now, the newest tweak, the newest tweak or whatever it is right now. But if you're not innovating constantly, your competitors will innovate around you and they'll eat your lunch. So how do you design a system in your company where you are just innovating constantly, even if it's a yearly or every two years or so? That's actually a very simple idea. I'll give you an abstract example. So here's another secret of mine. I used to teach salsa at one point. I know you used to sell comic books and all that. So how many things you used to do? <laughs> so yeah, so when I was at UBC, I was missing Trinidad. I love jazz. And I discovered that salsa is the most amazing combination of dancing and listening to jazz at the same time. If you like jazz and like dancing. Yeah, I, like, I love jazz. Salsa is phenomenal. So I fell in love with salsa. And as a student, it was $10 to go out in a night. You drank water and you danced with a different beautiful girl 
every four minutes. University student. But you come from Trinidad, though. Like, I don't know. That <laughs> yeah, we, we, we whine at a different, but it was, you got an exercise. It was great. Okay. Like it, yeah. and, but I was in Vancouver. There was no to go to or anything. So it was like the equivalent of me going to Fed was going me going to Salsa Night. And I got very good at dancing Salsa. And then when I was in England, I was broke. And my roommate said, hey, there's a Salsa teacher in the, in the community center that is going away and no longer teaching. Do you want to take over the class? I was like, that's a really good idea. So I was teaching Salsa for three hours a week making pounds and that was enough money to help me put me through a master's program, etc. Anyway, but that's beside the, 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 the point. The point I want to make is that innovation goes through a couple of phases and what, what people have to understand is in order to innovate, you have to get the basics right. When you're learning to dance salsa, after first teaching the steps, so one, two, three, four, five, six, dancing on steps and you're dancing on the eight beats in the song, you have to dance on six of those eight beats and you skip a beat in the middle. Before you perfect that, then you have to figure out how to involve your hands while moving your feet. Then you have to figure out how to involve your shoulders while moving your feet. Then you have to figure out how to like, you know what I mean? So there's steps you have to take. So basically you kind of go through, take your first beginner's class, we teach you 12 moves. You take novice class, we teach you another 24 moves. We take an intermediate class, we teach you another 24 moves. By now, you're up to about 60 moves, right? Then, once you get to that intermediate level, there comes a point when you now have about 80 moves in your arsenal. And what happens is learning moves in sequence. So think about musicians. You play a scale in a particular sequence. If the person who's following or the person who's leading does something you don't expect, because your arsenal is now big enough that you can recover if I lead the girl left and she turns right, I now have another move that I can move her into. So I have enough of a foundation that I can improvise on the dance floor. But I have to go through those levels. Same thing with jazz. You have to learn your skills. You have to go deep and understand that. Not all musicians can play jazz. They haven't done that stuff. And then you go up to like that mastery level. So I think... People go for, go to expert and then mastery. And I think the fundamental thing about innovation is that you have to get the basics right. And usually if you're running a company, most people are running a company at an intermediate level. And they have problems with the basics. If you have, if you have a successful company, et cetera, and you're seeing client experience popping up, you're seeing like cash flow issues popping up, you're seeing like human resource issues popping up. There's something that you're not doing back at the basics that is popping its head up at top. I'm willing to put my head on, I'm willing to say this. If you go back and get the basics, you could double the performance of your company. I'm willing to say that because every, in my experience when I was teaching salsa, when you start to teach people advanced moves, 90% of the time, it was something basic. I was tripping them up advanced level. So they often had to go back and practice some kind of basic maneuver that then got them through the advanced move. I think that is kind of true of all innovations. You have to get the basics right. Then you have to do the very mundane stuff, coding, the checklist, the, the mapping, the whatever, the building a mold 10 times and then getting it right. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. And so there's, it takes a lot of grit, dedication, et cetera. And then you can get to innovation. And there are ways you can do that. Like a checklist is an amazing innovation. Like there's a book about that. There's books around how like doctors using checklists and, and pilots using checklists. It's actually pilots. The airline industry, one of the biggest innovations to save most lives in, in air, is the airline industry in implementing people using checklists. Yeah. Imagine that. In a day when we're talking about AIs, one of the innovations that has saved the most lives, the checklist. That is the most basic innovation you can think of. And that's one of my issues with people thinking about innovation. It's like, time you talk about innovation technology, people think about AI. Yeah. Your shoe is a technology. Your backpack is a technology. Glasses are technology. Your chair you're sitting on is technology. And we forget that. Some of the fastest growing companies 
uh, companies that are making wooden toys because parents are moving away from giving their kids digital things. They want their kids to have analog things. So fastest growing companies are analog companies, companies that are building stuff because there are very few people who have those artisan skills. I mean, so innovation is about process. Oh, getting your processes right. And that's what we teach. We teach people how to do that. Like at the Covenant Group, we go through a whole process and we teach people how to do that. basics, etc. I'm lucky. I get to teach people things I love. How to innovate. No, I teach people how to build the company that they, that they want, the company, their dreams. Mm-hmm. One of my favorite stories is a, there's a guy who all he wanted to do was make this much income and spend this many hours with his kids. We worked with him to help him transform his company so he makes this much income and he can spend that much time with his kids. If we wanted to, we could help him grow a company that made twice, three times, four times as much money. That's not what he wanted. Most important thing for him, spend time with enough kids and have this quality of lifestyle. That's what we help him do. We help people build companies as they define it, not as we define it, because it's not, it's not my company. How long does it take to actualize? I would say most transformations take two to three years, like 18 months. Mm-hmm. It's a complete myth that you can do transformation in a short term, yeah. short time. Like it is complete myth. Like, yeah, it is really silly. <laughs> Dr. Keita Deming, where can we find you? I think if you Google my name, you find me. Keita Deming is a quite unique, unique name. K-E-I-T-A-T-E-M-M-I-N-G. Dot com is like the first stop. You can find me at the Covenant Group. We also run and host the Business Builder Academy at mybusinessbuilderacademy.com. Numerous places you can find me, but these days I'm hanging out at the Covenant Group. We're just helping companies grow and we're loving it and we're having a good time. So that's, that's what I'm doing. And if anybody like to help me bring these ideas to Trinidad, please call me because that's my number one goal in life is to make sure that this I came from mm-hmm. is one of the best places to live on earth. We are the best place to party on earth. <laughs> not quite the best place to live on earth. I love when the diaspora gets back. You know, I love when people from the diaspora get back to where they came from. That's, that's really I'm awesome. I'm going to do a plug here. Go ahead. I'm launching a new project oh. called 868 Change. And how 868 Change came about was in order to do TEDx Postman, we needed a non-profit. I was trying to do a project, but if companies are going to give you money, you need a non-profit. Companies can't give to an individual, they have to give to a non-profit. So we started this non-profit. And what happened to me is I noticed that we had a company that had audited accounts, a board, et cetera. And we were doing an event once a year. It was a complete waste of resources. We were doing an event and maybe using the account for two months of the year. For the rest of the year, account was dormant. So what we've done is we've set up Members Foundation. I think it's one of the first people's foundations. Uh, As a member of the diaspora, you could go to 868change.com, become a member, sign up, give a monthly donation, and we will direct those resources to ideas worth spreading, ideas worth doing in Trinidad and Tobago. It's called 868change, Ideas in Motion, we are gathering and catalyzing ideas worth doing in Trinidad and Tobago. We're just getting started, but it's taking me three years to build because for that, but Trinidad is a very difficult place to get stuff done. Mm-hmm. But I was very specific about how I wanted to build it. And the money goes straight to Trinidad. It doesn't go to a Miami account or anything like that, any other nonsense. It's completely trans- transparent and it's built for the diaspora primarily, and people living in Trinidad who want to make a difference because we do philanthropy in Trinidad needs to be disrupted. reason we need to do philanthropy is because our own livelihood depend on it. We have people in our system who will not be able to thrive in our system. We will continue to have locked gates, continue to have security issues. So people who continue to like hide from the issues they're not willing to put a hand up and roll up their sleeves. You are as much a part of the problem. Yes. And I will say even just as bad as somebody who was like, so for example, one of the things that really irks me is when people call people the element. I'll give you a story. People, Guy Griffith is the most dangerous person in Trinidad and Tobago. 
The reason he's dangerous is because he's attacking a symptom. Nothing he is doing is at the root cause. Nothing. First of all, where are the drugs coming from? So, secondly, why are the drugs illegal? Thirdly, who are the people being that he's going after? Fourthly, the biggest issue really is not like drugs, etc. It's corruption. So he's not really doing anything. What he's doing is a very good political show and he's competing with his other clung, Ian Allen. Like, it's on that level. And he's a gangster and he talks and, quite frankly, nothing he says is very intelligent. Like, it is not a systemic approach and that is the general problem with a lot of the things that we do in Trinidad. That's just my take and I, I dare you to prove me otherwise because... <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to tell Dave to edit that out. <laughs> I still live in Trinidad. I don't want to be. Yeah, well, you didn't say it. I said it. So I'm just saying, I just think like we have to get serious about understanding that we are our brother's keepers. And if our brothers are not doing well, we are not doing well. And as a fundamental thing, we need to understand in Trinidad. And it's not, it's something we get wrong, which is do unto others as they would like done unto them. That's what we see. That is wrong. It's do unto others as they would like done unto them. It's not about what you would like done unto you, because that is too self-involved. Right. And we miss that. It's a nuanced thing. They call it the platinum rule. I think it's really important that we understand that if we are not pulling up everybody and everybody is not thriving, and forget this nonsense about like race and like all that stuff. There are more privileged races in Trinidad, that is for sure. But as a Trinidadian, we are failing as a system because we are fighting each other unnecessarily and we have to come together. If we don't come together, you're gonna, we could end up like Venezuela, we could end up like Congo, we could end up so many places we could end up like. And it is too beautiful a country for that to happen. Like, I love that country that we call Trinidad and Tobago and really disappoints me when we do shallow things that really are not long-term and are actually not in our own best interest. And history is littered with examples of people who voted for things that are not in their best interest. Brexit is a good example of that. Yeah. What's happening in the United States? Is a good <laughs> of that. Oh, you want to be careful? No, watch it. <laughs> Look at you. I live in Canada. <laughs> but you get my point, right? Mm -hmm. My point is that Yes, I'm an entrepreneur. Yes, I believe people should build beautiful companies. I believe all of that. But that is not at the expense of other people not being able to thrive in the system. And I think, I just think that's unfair and that we are not contributing. We are part of the problem. And if we continue to do things that are band-aid things, we are part of the problem. That's the bottom line. Podcast will, there you have it. A disruptive conversation with Dr. Keita Deming. Subscribe to Caribbean Power Lunch at CaribbeanPowerLunch.com slash subscribe. Check us out on CastBox, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, wherever you listen to your podcasts. And with that, Dr. Deming, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for having me in your office here today. No problem. It's been a pleasure. I really enjoyed the conversation. And folks, thank you for listening. Podcast is one of my favorite mediums. I hope you have a wonderful day and go out there and do something bold, brave, and beautiful. And with that, Podcast World Toronto, we are out, eh? Peace. <laughs>